Sure, I'll, uh, I'll answer that in two halves. I'll tell you why it's working and I'll tell you why some people think it doesn't work. Might be the best way to approach it. Well, why does weight training work with cyclists uh, and endurance athletes in general is it will depend on what hat you put on. You can put on the hat of the neurophysiologist, the biomechanist, uh, the strength coach the, uh, the coach, the exercise scientist. In general, what we see if we introduce weight training into an endurance athlete's um, week, and let's say cycling athletes, what we see is an increase in strength without an increase in body mass initially. And that's because it's changes in um, how the nerve conduction is occurring and, and how we're innovating these muscles. And you actually get better at sending stronger and higher frequency nerve impulses to muscles, which actually increases the con force of contraction. And that happens pretty quickly, usually in about the first four to six weeks we see that change. So you, we can increase an athlete's strength without increasing body weight, which is usually pretty important in a sport like cycling where we're interested in power to weight ratio very often. Now, how is this um, newfound strength going to help you as a cyclist? Well, your gear ratios that you choose, it's going to help you keep on top of your pedals. What the broader scheme, if you look at the research as a whole from a, a perspective from a mountain top looking out at the horizon, yes. is it would appear that if we increase strength in an athlete, it seems to improve their ability to tolerate training loads, in particular acute training loads. And uh, the, the, so if you're going to tolerate more training load, then you can tolerate more stimulus. And then when you go through your recovery periods, you're going to have these bigger adaptations. You're going to have a bigger performance response. If we calculated it, what, what we generally find is the stronger athletes seem to be able to tolerate a bit more. We see that in across multiple sports, team sports, other insurance sports, is the stronger athletes seem to be able to tolerate whatever acute training loads we give them, whether it's so, daily or, 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 or their seven-day weekly load. They mm. seem to just respond to it better. They're not as fatigued. They're not as um, emotionally drained from it. They, if we have performance measures during that period of time, we don't see as big a change in their performance measure in terms of a negative performance change. So uh, we know that stronger athletes seem to be able to tolerate those acute loads a little bit better. And so if you can tolerate that type of training load, you're less likely to be injured. So you can train more. You're not going to have more uh, as many injury periods throughout the season. Um, the other part of it is if we can conceptualize here that let's say you and I, entered a race and uh, let's say we have a similar VO2 max, similar aerobic physiology, similar 20 minute uh, power output, similar body weight. Um, but on a, on a strength test, let's say uh, one of us is measuring height and Cam, we're gonna use you. Let's say we did a, a muscular test for the lower body, let's say a maximum leg press. Uh, and we're going, wow, Cam's actually 30% stronger than Aaron is in the legs, but they're pretty equal on these other parts of physiology with respect to the aerobic system. If we enter this race, you are starting with higher strength resources than I am starting. We are both experiencing fatigue during this race. So as we race, I'm starting from a lower level of strength and throughout our 200 kilometer race, my strength is gonna go down. And the reason it goes down is because I'm fatiguing. We, because we experience fatigue when we exercise. Yours is also going down as well. But because you started at a higher strength resource than I did, where are we going to be at the end of our 200 kilometer race? I'm still going to be lower. You're going to be relatively higher than me. So if it came down to a sprint or that tough hilltop finish, even though aerobically we're quite the same, you've got more leg strength than me and you didn't fatigue out as fast as me. So if I'm running out of my strength resources faster than you, because you started at a higher resource, it's pretty easy to work out who's probably going to do better at those tougher points in the race. And it might be a steep climb or a sprint. So they're the two ways I would typically view it. And I know there's a, a lot of ways would pe people would view it. But in summary, if, if we do weight training, we're going to have a higher amount of strength resources at the start of a race. So as we fatigue, you're going to be performing better at the end of it, particularly if there's an anaerobic performance required or a, um, you need to get on top of a heavy gear or it's gotten so steep that the gear now feels heavy. Um, and the second element is, is the stronger athlete can generally tolerate more acute training loads and they're not going to be as fatigued. And whilst there's not a lot of research investigating that in cycling athletes, we're seeing it in other sports. That seems to be the case that the stronger athletes are more resistant to injury. So they have less injuries through a season and they seem to pull up better from these spikes in training load. Yes. Well, what do you see anecdotally like working with the you know ARA riders and I, I know there's some that probably do more weight training versus the others. Are there, is there any stories or any things that come yeah. to mind? Um, look, anecdotally through the three athletes I've worked over the years and in particular the cycling athletes, the athletes have been pretty consistent with gym. Uh, when they have crashes, less likely to actually break something. And, and, and the athletes that have sort of seen having more issues with sort of broken collarbones or have had something with a uh, broken arm or what, what have you, 
it would be an athlete that sort of have had an extended break from gym. It might have been they've just come back from their off-season, so we've lost some time in the gym, um, or they've uh, had a, 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 you know, a, something going on in their life that meant they couldn't do gym for a period. They've fallen had a crash. And then on the flip side, I've had other athletes who have been... Uh, all those same athletes where they're going through a period of, of long weight training, we've sort of got sort of four to five to six months under our belt within the season and they have some pretty serious crashes. Whilst they're pretty banged up and bruised and we've all sort of been there with the scrapes on the skin, yeah. um, anecdotally, not breaking uh, any, any bones. And, and we've had some pretty serious crashes. Um, and, and I think a lot of people who ride their bike a lot, they've all had that major crash and you, you know, like, how did I make it through that one um and it's just quite interesting anecdotally for me i I see the athletes when we are going through a consistent weight training phase they seem to pull up better from a bone health perspective after the crashes um with respect to performance um uh, when you find out what type of training exercise an athlete responds to and this is where the individualization of training programs is important when when you nail that as a strength coach and go, oh, that that is what works for that athlete, the outcomes we see is you know, improvement in sprint power. Um, the athlete feels more technically proficient on their bike. They say, hey, I'm climbing up these hills and I'm I'm not rocking and rolling on the seat like I used to when I'm fatigued going up this six seven k climb. I feel very strong in my core. I feel very balanced. Gee, at the end of the race, I had a better uh, sprint performance than I thought that I had. Um, so these are sort of the anecdotal information coming back uh, from these athletes. Um, and in terms of objective measures, um, we sort of do body uh, scans um, where we sort of get an idea of what percent muscle change we've had over the season. Uh, and we've had athletes sort of, you know, put on between four and six kilos of muscle, which can be quite important when you're developing that sort of physique for the, the sprinter athlete, male or female, whether that, you know, that, that hard rider on the road, whether the one who's, you know, shutting down the breakaways, they're on the flat, they're just keeping the pace high where a little bit of mass can help because as you get that little bit heavier, a bit more powerful on the bike because you've got more muscle mass, but the bike keeps rolling as well because uh, the law of inertia is if you slightly increase mass, uh, your acceleration is less likely to change as dramatically. That works quite well for those riders where they're just suited to keeping the pace high on the on the flat ground. Um, or whether we're developing the, um, you know, the athlete coming out of high school where they're a bit of a whippet <laughs> and they need to put on just that little bit of uh, muscle mass and we've seen some good improvements in that space and, and it really helps them transitioning into sort of the under 19s under 23 racing where th- that sort of physicality element starts to come in um, in men's and women's racing i guess now might be a time to circle back to that original statement of why do some people think training's not beneficial uh, for their performance as an endurance athlete and in particular a cycling athlete well it could be due to some of the reasons I said where they've been given some exercises that are simply not suitable for them and it's caused pain, they've developed knee discomfort, it's affected their cycling. Um, the other uh, issue is they might be doing too much uh, or too, too much too soon. So we get a performance decrement because you've ramped up their training loads in the gym too quickly. So the athlete's not adapting to it uh, or they haven't been given an appropriate recovery period uh, to adapt to it after the stimulus has been applied. Um, from a research perspective, I think the most common research article people send me when they tell me that um, gym doesn't work and um, my work placement students are notorious for this. Right. <laughs> They're like, Aaron, I can see you working with a cycling team, but I read this article that says it doesn't work, um, X, Y, Z. And uh, the article that they normally show me is they had a, two cohorts of it's cycling. It's a bit harsh, isn't it? That's your job, essentially. <laughs> it's a bit harsh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah get out. Yeah. Um, so the study that they no- normally send me is, uh, I, and I Apologies to the researchers if they're listening to, I forget uh, which researchers um, were involved with this study. They had uh, two cohorts of cyclists. They had one cohort, they said, we want you to do, uh, all, all on the same team. And they said, we want this group of cyclists to do the training they're normally doing, but we also want you to do two to three days of gym on top of that. And then the other group was, hey, we're going to pull back on your cycling training load. We're going to drop two days of cycling a week, and we're going to replace those with two gym sessions. And then they followed those athletes, I think it was a six or 12 week period. And they were like, okay, which uh, athletes improved with respect to these performance measures we had? And they had a few sprint uh, power-based measures and some other on-bike measures. And they were like, oh, the athletes that we kept their cycling training the same, but also gave them strength training, uh, actually got like slightly worse. They didn't, it, it didn't help them at all. And then we had this other group, when we sacrificed two days of cycling and put Jim in there, um, then we actually got some improvements in these variables that we were assessing, these bike performance variables. And so people are like, oh, it doesn't work then if you're just going to pluck, you know, the average cyclist out of the system and give them 
gym on top of that, they're not going to do any better. And no cyclist wants to give up two days on the bike, so gym effectively doesn't work. Well, the issue uh, with that study is when you keep training load the same, but then introduce a new stimulus, which was the gym training, uh, the athletes had a percent increase in their training load over uh, the study period. So we know that if we increase training load over a period, athletes will usually initially have a decrement in performance because you've increased training load on them. Whereas the other cohort they're comparing it to, you took out two days and then put gym in uh, in replace of these bike days. So they probably actually recovered a little bit from their bike loads and then had ample time to recover from the new stimulus, which was the gym. So we couldn't, you can't compare apples and oranges like that. If, mm. if we want to see if it works, we needed to take the cohort out where we subtracted the uh, two days of cycling out and introduced gym. Let's move that. Let's just investigate this group here. And we would expect a performance decrement after six, six weeks of that because we've introduced two days of extra training on them and the athlete was used to training five days a week. Mm. And we introduced two extra gym days on top of that. Well, now it's seven training sessions they're doing a week compared to their five. So we should see a performance decrement. But then we would need to go through a recovery period let the athletes adapt and that might be a two-week period where we just pull back the training volumes then we apply again we build back loads and then we pull back recovery again and then let's do a comparison over the six-month period and see how well those athletes did and uh, that's why i think a lot of people are waving that study around and saying well it, it doesn't work unless you sacrifice cycling and, and it's not correct it was we needed to compare apples with apples with that particular study. And, you know, we'll get there. Um, and there's other great research that's come out. Um, uh, in particular, um, Ronestad, who's done some research in 2010, he's produced a couple of research papers. And, and his research is really good. He ha follows the athletes for six uh, and 12 weeks and quite long studies. And he is showing that, hey, if you prescribe the right loads and just take your time, with respect to monitoring the response, making sure there are recovery periods there, we actually do see performance benefits on the bike as a result of strength training.